Jean Wavels. Bom dia. Um, oops, something wrong. Okay, my name is Izumi Aizu. Um, I'm the organizer or coordinator of this session. And this is my ACE IGF. So how many people are the first time coming to IGF? Could you raise your hand? Wow, about half. Welcome. How many has got all eight? Myself only. I guarantee you there's no reward, no money, no nothing. <laughs> um, more than three times? Not that many. Anybody last year in Baku? One, two, three. Okay. Then uh, think without um, losing much more time, although... I'm expecting one more speaker to come, but I um, haven't seen her yet. Um, the title of this workshop has been modified. Um, I added two words first, maximizing the power, or maximizing the. Because the official submission, uh, the, the number of words or characters were limited to 50. So I, I had to delete maximizing the power into just the power of the internet. But um, original intention or intent was to how to really make full use of the internet to deal with such large um, natural powers, such as the disaster of any kind or the growing environmental or climate change thing. Um, and actually... Uh, we were asked to merge the two original proposals, one from my end and another from the ITU's end, um, and we happily accepted that. So um, there are many, many <laughs> organizers uh, on the screen. Um, some of them sent the, their reps or speakers, others just uh, sitting behind the scenes or happily supporting us. I'm not going to go into the details of these. These are all on the website. Um, the, the agenda of this session is uh, it's divided into three or largely two sections. The first section is divided into session one and two, while the two presentations for each subject, the first one is using the internet and big data to, as a buzzword, to manage large-scale natural disaster or disasters. And the second one is using internet-based services to manage global climate change. And I ask the speakers to strictly stick to the 10 minutes of the presentation, which would give uh, five minutes for two uh, in each slot of the question and answers. Um, we have the remote moderator, Cheryl. Um, she volunteered and uh, we try to read the screen from the remote hubs. If any question or comment comes up, you can just signal us. And in the pr appropriate context, we'll pick it up and add to our dialogue. Um, and then if we manage this, then we'll have some 50 minutes for open discussion. The session is yours, okay? Unless you come, you come up with some burning questions or interesting observations, this workshop will become very boring. I guarantee you. So sometimes I ask you to take notes during the speeches. Don't think of the questions after the presentation is over, but it, while it's progressing, especially for those first time comers to the IGF, we try to make it as interactive as the internet itself is. Um, so, and if the session goes well, I'll wrap up in five minutes. If not, forget. <laughs> Um, so, this workshop will provide an overview of the use of the internet-based services and ICTs for climate change adaptation, disaster risk management or reduction, and policy, legal, and regulatory frameworks. Um, and then we may hear something uh, interesting use of the big data. Um, but most of these activities are actually guided under something called multi-stakeholder participation. Government alone cannot really deal with the natural disasters. Uh, the businesses are often asked to go support them, and a civil society may go to the site or 
stay behind and give all the logistical supports, as I've observed many times. And likewise, for the climate change, n none of the government has enough budget to deal with that, first of all. And we need technologies, we need the technicians or academics, um, all of us. So um, that's why we felt this um, you know, theme really fits with the IGF under the multi-stakeholder um, discussion. So uh, I'd like to introduce some speakers today. Um, okay, here, Ms. Amber Sari Dewi from Jalam Murapi. Jalam Murapi is the, was established in 2006 by three community radios in the slope of Mount Murapi, which is about three hours flight from here. It's a big volcano and which erupted in 2010 and a few hundred people were killed, I believe. But uh, there were some, you know, works with the several NGOs, and uh, I think that it's uh, so. It's before the eruption; it was formed. We'll hear from her later. And is our second speaker is Fumi Yamazaki, and she is the program manager, developer relations at Google. I think she, you are sort of an evangelist, <laughs> and she also, uh, before moving to the U.S. this year. She's been very active in supporting the, uh, how do I say, the uh, recover or rescue works uh, at Google. And uh, we'll hear very interesting stories how Google and many people together uh, try to deal with this East Japan great earthquake and tsunami disaster happened um, two years ago. And I will, I, I've been also working on that. Um, now we have Thomas Lamanskas. Uh, he is the advisor on ICT environmental and climate change at ITU. Um, um, don't know which country you're from. Lithuania. Lithuania, yes. And um, yeah, that's a lovely country. And who hosted in IGF three years ago? Yeah, I was there. Um, I'm expecting Miss Nevin Tewishpik head of research studies and policy at the Ministry of Communication and IT at, from the Egyptian government. But unfortunately, I haven't seen her yet. Um, but she is the fourth speaker, so I hope she will come in time. Um, remote moderator, again, Shirley Harista uh, from ID Confing. is one of the very vocal NGOs in Indonesia and for one of the main drivers of the IGF in Indonesia. Now she's studying at Singapore's um, Nanyang Technology University. Um, and myself, I work for the Institute for Infosocionomics. Don't ask what it is. Um, I've been working on this policy and governance issue of the internet for about 10 or 15 or 20 years. So without further ado, I'd like to um, give the floor to um, Amber. Hope this works. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Amber Sari Dewi. You can call me Amber. I'm uh, Jalin Merapi, Twitter administrator, actually, media center staff. Uh, when Mon Merapi in 2010 erupted, um, Jalin Merapi is an uh, abbreviation for Jaringan Informasi Lingkar Merapi, in Merapi Information Network. In uh, Mount Merapi in Yogyakarta, and our office is based in Yogyakarta, so I came from Yogyakarta. For those who don't know the Mount Merapi location, Mount Merapi is uh, uh, located in um, three region: Yogyakarta, Klaten, Boyolali, and Magelang of four. In three. Uh, uh, in a very dense population. The most uh, dense is in Yogyakarta, in Sleman. Uh, it's to me said that two, 200 people were killed when Merapi erupted. It was from the Sleman, from Yogyakarta, as the victim. Um, Mount Merapi is one of the most active volcano in the world. With uh, It has specific 
uh, Arab uh, specific behavior related to its eruption. So it didn't uh, blow up like a bomb, but it just melted. Its lava just melted uh, uh, in a way. But they also has uh, sorry, Mount Merapi has uh, in our language called Wadus Campbell pyroclastic clouds that is very uh, dangerous for people because it has uh, when it flow it can uh, reach the speed up to 100 kilometers per hour it's very fast so that's why that the pyroclastic clouds is the most dangerous um, the most dangerous that killed 200 people in 2000 uh, 2010 so about the Jalan Merapi, we, it was established in 2006 by three community radios. Um, community radio Lintas Merapi, Lintas Merapi in Teles Klaten, and then the MMC FM Selo in Boyolali, and then uh, KFM in Dukon Magelang. Um, we, the three community radio that uh, established Jalan Merapi was big, sorry, uh, community radio was big by the people in Slope of Merapi because they want to uh, inform and make uh, people in the Slope of Merapi to be aware of the dangers of uh, Merapi so that can be prepared for all the time. And also that the, in, 2000, in 2006 the uh, the radius of pyroclastic is not very, it's not very wide. But when Merapi erupted in 2006, with its magnitude of uh, eruption and also the the damage that caused by Mount Merapi, Jalan Merapi and then decided to use more very uh, various technology ICT information technology, information communication technology and media to inform and to distribute, uh, especially to distribute in information to a wider public. Next slide, I will um, explain a type of technology, type of ICT that uh, used by Jalin Merapi. Here's the summary of our um, ICT, so challenge Merapi uh, use. There are, I have counted, there are 14 types of ICT and media that used by the Jalan Merapi. As you can see, we, we put it on a website. Um, the website is uh, combine.org.id and you can challenge Merapi combine.org.id. Um, we use community radio broadcasting, two-way communication radio, CCTV, fixed telephone, SMS, gateway website, and etc. Uh, why we use different types of ICT, and to, I will explain in the next slide. Um, as you can see in the table, we have uh, different technology with different pattern and different user, user and con content. The, the uh, left uh, row is the content and function. For example, uh, two-way communication radio, we, with its format is audio and uh, the communication pattern is many-to-many -many and synchronous. We understand that the two-way communication radio users is widely used by our volunteer and then for by our police police and military team or especially rescue rescue team because of the users and so the um, two way communication radio was used for team coordination and also we use it for live audio streaming source especially for Jalit Merapi. Uh, on the other hand, Twitter or, or Facebook, as you can see, as in, especially in Facebook, you, we can upload and download text of photo or, or videos with many-to-many uh, -many communication patterns and synchronous. 
uh, for your information, Jalin Merapi has four Facebook groups which consists of 250 people in it. So we almost have 1,000 uh, members in our groups in four different uh, groups. And with very wide range of users from volunteers, displaced people, public, um, and then uh, aid agency or persons who became uh, become our member of um, in, in Facebook's group. Oh my God. Uh, with, uh, so we have different content and function with uh, Facebook. So we, can, we use Facebook to update our latest situation. Our volunteer use it for coordination between uh, headquarters and the coordination post and sometimes the coordination between the IT people uh, at agency or person. So why we use 14 types of ICT because we, we know and we understand that different type of technology serves different users with its different uh, content and function. Uh, okay, uh, challenge Rapi Twitter account at the time we have 14, 45,000 followers at the time. We now have almost 55,000 uh, followers. We managed to distribute 4,000 volunteers, and, and from the during the eruption and after, and about uh, as you can see, it is a map of uh, the world, and um, followers of Jalilus Merapi, most of them is from Indonesia and outside, from 45% from outside Indonesia. As you can see from in Indonesia, from Indonesia, 61% is from outside Jogja or Jakarta. As uh, we learned that uh, the followers was parents who, who were worried about the children who go to college in Jakarta, or sometimes uh, children of children with, with, who have parents who live in Jakarta or near Merapi worried about their their parents' um, situation. Yeah. Uh, next slide is about the challenge Merapi on Twitter. I can I capture it from the research uh, from Miss uh, Professor Merina Lim and Dewi Utami in 2011. Uh, Professor Merina Lim from Arizona University. As you can see, in November, the number of Twitter is very high, and the traffic of Jalil Merapi Twitter is very high also in the, during the October to November. The big eruption is in 5th November. And then uh, popular words in Jalil Merapi tweets is, uh, Relawan is for mar uh, volunteers, the about the demand about Merapi and POSCO. POSCO is uh, coordination post. And also numbers of tweets. Okay, one more. Uh, this is about the classification of challenge Merapi hashtag. We uh, Lim and Utami has for category with different hashtag that uh, he uh, collected. Okay, what is uh, what can we learn from challenge Merapi? We believe that public participation is very essential in disaster management, but what kind of ICT technology could engage public participation. Um, as you can see that we have 14 types of ICT, so we, we, uh, we strongly believe that it's not really enough to rely on one type of technology, so we have to convergence it because uh, every type of technology has its advantage and disadvantage. For, uh, for example, two-way communication radio is only to uh, audio and many-to-many, uh, -many, but synchronous. But when everybody wants to hear the uh, information uh, traffic by two-way communication radio, it can be jammed. Mm -hmm. So different people, group of people and community use different type of technology because uh, in, my, in our experience, 
uh, lower uh, middle and lower class of society use Facebook more familiar than Twitter because it because they think that Twitter is more complex and very uh, hard to to understand. So they they tend to use Facebook because they can upload uh, photo easily and uh, just type the status. One thing, <laughs> the most important thing is we know that it's not the technology, new technology that matters, but familiar and widely used of technology that counts on disaster management, on disaster risk protection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Amber, and sorry to rush you, but uh, that's my function, um, not my personality. <laughs> um, just one quick question um, before moving to Humi. Um, have, has the technology saved the lives of the people? Yes. Could you tell how or why? Yes, of course. Uh, lives of people. Okay. Uh, in my experience, as as Jalins Merapi Twitter account administrator, uh, we have one ta one one night uh, we have uh, demand from our uh, survivor. 6,000 um, rice uh, because they just moved from the peak of Merapi to the shelter mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in 9 p.m. in night and then they didn't they, ha they haven't eat for a day and they want to they have to, to eat before they get sick mm -hmm. they, they, there was um, there were 6,000 people there and they need food immediately and one of our volunteers called the headquarters and with very uh, processing they she asked me to how can we find 6000 6000 rice for the service the food yeah yeah and then we we uh, tweeted in our channel in twitter and then in just one hour we can collect 6000 yeah. uh, food for the survivors yeah, Twitter was widely used via the mobile, I believe, yeah. and, uh, with the youngsters especially. Yeah. And uh, they s made all the breakfast the next morning for yeah. 6,000. I heard it was more than 6,000, but yeah. the figures but may not. One in one place. Right. Um, because another friend of mine, Balance, told me also that they set up some FM radio station to share the early warning yeah. to evacuate. Otherwise, may more of hun hundreds of people yeah. would have been killed yeah, exactly. and in the secondary evacuation areas. Yes. Right. Exactly. So sometimes the technology works, um, but sometimes they don't. So Humi, could you tell what you did or what they did during or after the uh, East Japan Great Earthquake and Tsunami? Okay, thank you, Azumi-san, and hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Fumi Yamazaki, and I'm from Google, and I will talk about the power internet for a disaster. So, as many of you may know, in 2011, March 11th, a big earthquake of magnitude 9.0 hit Japan, and which ended with this big tsunami and nuclear power plant accident. So we, as Japanese, not just me, not just, just Google, but a lot of people in Japan started hoping and a lot of technology industry people started helping using technology. And I'd like to explain with four phases that we did. So one is respond, rebuild, remember, and prepare. So the first phase, respond. Right after the earthquake hit Japan, a lot of technology people, our engineers and webmasters, they started working on what they can do while they were shaking in the buildings. And two hours after the uh, earthquake hit Japan, we launched something called Person Finder a service that you can find people or you can tell people where they are. 
And EY is very simple. As you can see, I'm looking for someone. I have information about someone. And the launch speed was really important. And it actually helped a lot of people. But one thing that we learned is that in the reality, in the, the places that had the disaster, people were not using the internet. So what happened was people were writing their names in the evacuation centers and put it up on the walls. So they didn't have internet, they just like put, it, put the paper. It was very analog. And we can't search that, right? So we quickly thought we have to adjust to the reality of what's happening. So we had the people in these areas take photos of these paper with the camera phones and upload it. And we know they can't transcribe and they don't have you know, a, a lot of power in the first place. So people all around the world, including many of them in Japan, started transcribing and make it available on text searchable so that it's not just a picture, but it's searchable. When you do that, we were sort of like thought about, would there be spams? Like we were inviting all the people in the internet contribute to this project, right? We were initially concerned, but we just like thought we should just go for it. And what happened was there was no spam. Actually, people started like discussing, is this A or B or like, some of them were very hard to read, but people started discussing and solved and organically solved these problems. And we thought it's really important to trust people in this situation. And we had like 5,000 volunteers making 600,000 records of these names. It was incredible. Michael One, yeah, uh, it wasn't actual overnight because people were throwing information all the time. It was a process. <laughs> and the other thing that was interesting was that all the, the police, local governments, NHK, the broadcasting, all these companies or organizations had their own database of people. And it was not searchable in one shot. So they, we actually talked with all the people so that we can put these data in Person Finder. And when the users come, they can search all across police, local governments, NHK, and mobile carriers, all these information in one shot, which is very use, powerful for the users. So that was the response part, which I have 30 more <laughs> examples, but let's move on to the rebuild part. Because after some time passed, uh, Japan thought about rebuilding the economy, rebuilding the cities, and recovering from the uh, disaster. And in that phase, we started doing other things, such as creating online presence and creating online businesses for the small and medium-sized businesses, because Tohoku was not a very tech-savvy area. So people didn't have like websites, they didn't have e-commerce sites. So we started helping them learn about these things that started. And the other thing was for the younger generation, we started something called Tohoku Tech Dojo, so that they can learn to code, learn to make how, make how to make applications, and make the next industry for the younger generation. And um, the academia, local businesses, local governments, all these different people are focused on making this happen so that we can recover from the disaster. So it's a very multi-stakeholder type of efforts happening in Japan. The other thing is remembering. As you can imagine, people forget. And it's really important that we keep the memories for the future. And this memory, Mirai no Kyoku means memory for the future in Japanese. And when you go to this site, you can see actually pictures and videos before the tsunami and after the tsunami. But this specific screenshot shows you one same place, which has on Street View. So we, we had the cars go around and take the Google Street View images before the tsunami, which is, you know, the, the building is intact. And four months later, when there's all these rubbishes, and then two years later, when it was cleaned up. So you can see, like, in time phrases, how the things changed and keep the memories. And I think it's really important that we remember, and until Japan recovers, like, we keep helping, we keep hacking, we keep contributing. Hack for Japan is another organization that I started. It's a community of developers trying to use technology to help people. So we had a lot of hackathons to uh, disaster recovery. And this is sort of the mantra for Hack for Japan. While Japan is recovering, we will hack and continue to contribute. The fourth element that we are doing is prepare. As you know, Japan has earthquakes all the time. And Tohoku, which was hurt by the 9.0 magnitude uh, earthquake, so they actually had 30, in every 30 years, they had a huge tsunami. So they knew it was coming. And now that we had this huge earthquake and tsunami, we know it's going to be coming. So we need to learn from what we experienced this time and prepare for the next disaster because we know it's going to be coming. So uh, um, a year and a half after the uh, earthquake, 
We started something called Project 311, Great East Japan Earthquake Big Data Workshop. That's a kind of long <laughs> title of a project. But what we actually did was we had a lot of data providers provide data. For example, Google, Twitter, Honda, Zermi Data Com, like newspaper companies. And so all these companies and organizations provided data based on what they had from one week from the earthquake and let the researchers and our, um, analysts and everybody analyze these data so that we can learn from what we did. And the actual data provided by these companies was travel road data uh, provided by Honda. So they knew based on GPS which cars were moving and which roads were blocked based on the GPS, right? Uh, railroad operation information, real-time population estimation. This is based on mobile phones. So you don't know where people actually are, but you know where the mobile phones are, right? So they estimated that based on where the mobile phones are and how they're moving, they estimated where the population is in that area. And then newspaper articles, TV summaries, all these uh, tweets, data were provided. So that researchers from academia, researchers from private companies, bureaucrats of the ministry actually joined and started uh, analyzing. And journalists and hackers and developers, all these people got together to learn from the data that we have from the earthquake and tsunami and nuclear power plant accident. And because we have limited time, I actually have like 50 projects coming out of this research data. I'll just ex um, explain two of them. So one is called Project Hayano. It's made by um, Professor Hayano. So he actually wanted to know where the people were when the nuclear power plant accident happened. The reason is iodine has half-life of eight days. So when the earthquake and tsunami nuclear power plant accident hit Japan, they didn't have all the Geiger counters, so they didn't have really the, um, the data of what was happening, right? And after things had um, calmed down, it's too late because already eight days have passed, so they really can't calculate how many people are getting all this iodine radiation. So what he did was getting the, uh, all the uh, radiation simulations overlapped with um, the human congestion data, the, the population estimation data, and tried to figure out how many people, especially youngsters, were there based on this data. And the, his ultimate purpose is when these younger generation get cancer in the future, they can get this evidence as um, a proof of the cancer and the radiation, um, the accident, um, without the, the, the victims have to um, prove, prove that um, there was a causal relationship. Because otherwise, they have to prove in order to get the compensation for the government. So that, that getting that bill into the, the government is actually his uh, purpose. Uh, the second example is called, okay, this is the last one. <laughs> the second example is uh, called media coverage map. Uh, this is uh, done by Professor Watanabe. He actually took the data from uh, mass media, where mass media was reporting, based on TVs and newspapers, and where the social media was reporting. So you sort of see the gap between what the mass media was saying and what the social media was saying and what they were missing. So it sort of like, you know, energized that they can know where the gap is and start thinking about how to fix this mass media coverage. So that was the second example. And last thing I wanted to say is um, so many people from the global community um, help Japan recover and respond. And we would like to thank you for supporting. And I think it's our responsibility to share with you what we learned and so that we can be, like, together we can make a more, more resilient place. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fumi. Um, just one more question. Um, what are the, your continued efforts? going forward? So um, the recovery part is actually, you know, start, it's not there yet. <laughs> Where continued effort to recover is the biggest thing, I think. And as, are you going to be speaking about the, the conference? So there's a conference, ongoing conference, that is talking about how can technology contribute to the disaster, and we're still discussing, learning, and sharing. So. Yeah, unfortunately, people often start to prepare after the big disaster they experience, mm -hmm. which happened in Indonesia after 2004's Aceh's tsunami. Um, there's another organization called Eaputi, yeah. led by Mr. Valence Riyadi, 
who's in this building, but unfortunately not in this room, uh, started to fly into the most devastated areas with Wi-Fi and stuff like that, and they also helped at his um, eruption cases. But um, um, now I think I'd like to open the floor for about five minutes if you have any questions or comments. Any comments from the remote participants? Not yet so far? Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Jenny. I'm from the University of Toronto. Um, and I guess my question is, um, what's your opinion on privacy when a lot of this data is used for emergency response? So um, I think during the disaster, a lot of things, the priority sort of changes, whether getting the privacy information, like name of the people on the paper, on the walls, like usually you don't put people's name on the walls, right? But because you want to find people, and it's priority for a lot of people, um, I think it's a combination between like what is important, what is priority in that situation. For example, Person Finder, when we had the launch and people are still trying to find people, we kept the uh, site launched or like live. And then when the importance decreased, we actually took down the site so that, so, so it's a balance between what is important and what is a privacy concern. So, and Okay, um, in Jalin Merapi experience uh, about privacy, we we really uh, protect the privacy of our, especially for our victims. Or, and for example, when uh, there are pictures of people who really have blood in everywhere, we we can we send a strong protest to the media, hopefully again. But in in urgent and emergency situations in, in my slides, as you can see, we have to put n n a, a mobile telephone number so that they can, uh, in one way and another, we use it as a to verify it and to uh, make sure that the information sent to us is valid so that we can uh, verify the, the information. But um, the uh, private data from our volunteers and our aid agency is only for us and we, if someone wants to know and see it, we have to ask for the permi uh, permission first. Thank you. Um, one more question. Good morning. My name is Zola. I'm with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, I'm curious. You gave a long list of some of the stakeholders that you use to disseminate the information, and um, I'm curious if you've thought about using public libraries as an access point for this. They're often connected to many of these stakeholders. They have access to the technology as well as trained staff to uh, help people use the technology all the way from getting online to doing the coding, and they're trusted by their communities. The public libraries are, we're doing a lot of their things as well, but on the ground, like even the libraries, they were hit by tsunami. Right? And then from far away, they were not very involved. Although the National Library of Japan, uh, I think he had, they had like a archiving project that they were doing. So, so in different dimensions, they were doing things, but um, in terms of like immediately getting the information, <laughs> they were not that responsive in that. Is there, is there more that public libraries could do to work with you in that situation? I think so, yeah. My colleague or friend has organized one thing called Safe MLAK, Museum Library Archives and Kominkan, which means community centers all together in the devastated areas. However, the penetration of public libraries in Japan is maybe one-tenth of that of the U.S. or Canada. They're not that much outreaching to the people. So that's, that's me, you know, different country, locale, situation has different, you know, weights for these public institutions. Yeah, um, but anyway. Uh, I think I, I tapping into libraries makes sense, but there's a limit to what they can do in technical sense. Like in Tohoku's libraries, they were not tech savvy, so 
so they can contribute, although there's certain levels of contribution. Okay, um, one more. I said five minutes, but it's getting a little bit more. <laughs> and uh, please indulge with us. And one more and quick question. So my name is Don Hollander from PIP, uh, and my question is, what do you do uh, if the infrastructure, if the link to the internet outside of your community uh, fails? So in, in terms of the, the issue in Indonesia, if you lose your, your off-island link, uh, do you have enough robustness to keep your, your local web servers up and running? Okay. Um, in my experience, maybe my friends from Jalim Rabi can also help me to answer. Uh, we uh, we have we have uh, help from S E Z from uh, RG, uh and then from uh, yeah, yes Air Puti who borrow us the satellite uh, yeah uh, Fisat yes for uh, the Fisat who to um, uh, prepare the internet infra infrastructure in the in the shelter. But that's why we don't really uh, rely on internet, actually. That's why we, we have 14 types of uh, ICT, because we understand that when disaster occur, um, we can, uh, we pick one, which one, which technology that really should with the situation, current situation. At the time, we know that two-way communication radio is very effective and then the mobile phone, SMS, really, really effective until we can uh, set the internet infrastructure. If we can use, we can do it in, in um, immediate time. We have, we, we need to, we need days to set up the internet connection, but during the time we still have to inform people outside the Merapi about what happened in the situation of India. So that's why we choose different types of technology actually. Add a little bit of a Japan. Oh, okay, so so I think there's three layers, like mobile and phone, it was mostly dead. <laughs> and then internet, it was flaky, but sometimes alive and sometimes like dead. So so internet was a bit more <laughs> useful in that sense. And then there's a web server type, like so the local government's web server went down because they didn't expect access normally, right? And then they had a huge amount of access when the, uh, the disaster happened. So there was a lot of efforts to uh, back up the web servers of local governments and keep it running so that people can get access. So there's several layers about the, um, getting the connection. From what I heard from Valence in Indonesia, uh, the government of Indonesia is preparing some 2,000 vehicles with satellite dishes uh, to be uh, always there in the community. And once some disaster happens, they will become sort of hubs they not only have the proper antennas, they have web servers, mail servers, printers, engines, generators. So it's sort of self-sufficient vehicles that can be moved from the non-affected areas to the affected areas relatively quickly, which I haven't seen many other countries doing that. Uh, Japanese Ministry of Internal Affairs actually started doing the satellite connections after the earthquake. But Japan has a similar idea, but the Minister of Finance said, no, that we don't have that money for 2,000 vehicles. <laughs> well, without further ado, I'd like to move to the second part of our session, if you allow us. And while the speaker is um, preparing, here's the Mr. Thomas Lamnaskas. He's the advisor on ICT's Environment and Climate Change at International Telecommunications Union, or ITU. ITU has been fairly active in the dealing with the global climate change. I actually sort of co-proposed and did a workshop on the climate change and internet in Kenya's IGF. Um, before that, they organized a big uh, symposium in, in uh, Kyoto, Japan. Um, oops. Um, and uh, they're trying to deal with some uh, re um, data center thing and all the telecom consumption of the energy and stuff like that. But I think um, Thomas will give us much more detailed things. And because, unfortunately, we don't have Ms. Tewitik, 
from Egypt is she in this room no so you have slightly more than 10 minutes 15 if you like a bonus Thank, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. So I'm Thomas Lomanauskas from, uh, as we said, the International Communications Union. So also I'm very humbled to speak now after hearing these examples of people who worked on the ground and responded directly to disasters. You know? We just try to think ourselves who help the people who do the helping. You know? so, so it's not that glamorous, it's not that uh, on the ground. Is it? Yeah. But, uh, but I think that's uh, actually sometimes good to also think of the broader picture and how we can, as, a, as a, we said, not do the preparation after the disaster, but do the preparations before that happens, and also to think also longer, in the longer term, especially when we think about the climate change, and, and also how we can mitigate that now rather than wait until it, uh, it becomes something that it's, it brings more disasters. So, uh, of course, disasters is not something that we can totally avoid, you know, as we know, and and we can see, you know, we can do a lot about that. We can, you know, prepare, we can mitigate, and, you know, we can uh, then try to respond, but it's very unlikely we'll be able totally to avoid. So we need to find a ways to actually use our resources and uh, make the necessary actions to kind of make that impact of disasters as, as least as possible, and we can recover as soon as possible. So in terms of ICTs, and I wouldn't surprise anyone here to saying, you know, to kind of demonstrating the ubiquity of the tools, and that means that you know we use ICTs for every everyday life. It's not only in you know in developed world, but uh, developing world basically now every you know number of mobile devices reach the number of the people in the world, and uh, we have uh, broadband uh, penetrations also increasing. Even though we still have you know we have 4.4 billion people which who are unconnected, and that's another kind of bigger challenge, which is most of all outside the narrow topic of this or the narrower topic of this discussion, you know, how we, you know, make sure that those tools are available for everyone, because many of those people actually, many of the disasters happen actually in the places where, you know, where people are not connected, and though they have that tool to respond. So also, to some case, examples show that, you know, especially in the places where internet is ubiquitous, that, you know, people, uh, you know, this is the media that people like, want to use, and need to use, when they want to communicate to their loved ones uh, when the, and want to broadcast to the world what's happening when a disaster strikes. And that means that it's not, you know, this is a clear demonstration that we need to be prepared also to use that technology because people are there. And of course, you know, so then some of the simple examples, just, just a demonstration examples, why it's important to talk about Internet and why it's important to talk about data uh, or data network, the packets-based networks in disasters, because you know some of the example here me, uh, just shows that in some cases packet-based networks can provide more resilient way to provide information to disasters when the networks are clogged and it's not very easy to go through with the voice calls or in text messages. Packet-based networks can actually provide uh, a way to inform uh, other people and to communicate uh, on, on certain areas faster. And this is just one example of that. So we need to talk about that. So, okay, back just a bit now and back to the bigger picture. So what is ITU and why we care about this topic? So ITU is the United Nations Agency for ICTs with a broad mandate covering radio communications, covering standardization, and covering development. And when, as you'll see in presentation, when we talk about this topic, all of those different areas come together when we need to both respond to disasters and adapt to climate change. We have 193 member states. And what's also important and what we're really proud of, we also have 700 private sector members and 63 academia members. That means it's not only about member states. That means it's about, about cooperation between the various stakeholders and getting the knowledge of various stakeholders and also being able to collaborate and assist various stakeholders. And this is just some examples on this slide, but I'll uh, expand further how we also, you know, we have capabilities and we do respond you know, on the spot, you know, when the, when the, when the kind of events happen. And we do provide equipment to the, um, to the countries, uh, including year time. And, and uh, like in 2012, we had our equipment stations in Haiti and Cape Verde. And, uh, and we, we do respond to countries in need when, uh, when the disaster strikes. And we also have a, you know, we help the countries to, to prepare for emergency 
to have emergency communication plans. From our uh, radio, uh, so from pr perspective of radio communications, so at the Big ATU's work is general worldwide coordination of the use and allocation of radio spectrum, and in that context also radio spectrum that is used for uh, climate monitoring, for climate change prediction, for also sensors, and so everything that's wireless and radio you know, needs to be coordinated, and that usually happens on the very highest level, happens in world radio conferences, the next one we have in 2015, and then, you know, happens regional radio conferences, and then it's further developed in the more detailed standards that are then implemented in the member states and countries. So this is, this is crucial to make sure that those devices can work, those devices can, allocate, can be allocated. Well, so in this context, uh, the... Uh, to use also the depository of tem temporary conventions, so almost all many people in this room know about that, that allow uh, countries to use equipment easier and uh, special radio equipment easier when a disaster strikes, and kind of especially when we talk about bringing equipment from overseas. So ITU works helping uh, member states and, and, and other stakeholders throughout the, throughout the, as we call, disaster management timeline in terms of establishing, assisting in establishing the baseline, assisting in establishing risk analysis, monitoring yellow warning, and then even assisting, as we said, directly. So uh, we have, uh, so we, what ITU's, a lot of work in ITU is being done uh, through so-called study groups. So that means the, the, the groups that member states and, and other stakeholders, our sector members, so-called, which is our private sector members and academia meet to develop standards, develop handbooks, develop recommendations, and then you know, to find the ways uh, how, how that could be best implemented. So where you see ITUT, this is our standardization sector, and ITUD or ITUBDT is our development sector. And so we have specific study groups that, lead, that deal with the uh, locations for disaster, uh, uh, relief and early warning, uh, network resilience and recovery. We have a separate study group five, which is on environment and climate change as well, and some aspects of that is also covered in our study group on security, study group 17. But also we have in the development sector a study group that deals with emergency locations and preparedness of the special developing countries in that regard. Uh, part of our work is also because I, one, part of ITU's work is also uh, international telephone numbers, so coordinating the numbering scheme uh, worldwide. So that was uh, one of the that part of the, of the work related to disaster recovery is assigning a country code 888 uh, to OCHA, which can be used for equipment and for communications during the disaster time when, for example, the old networks in the country, in country networks are down and can't be communicated and they need to be very quickly rebuilt and reestablished. Uh, so now more on the uh, resilience and, and uh, ICTs and climate change. So, uh, so so first of all, so we have as, as well a question, so-called the study group five, which is working on that, and our, our, our standards, so-called serious L standards, that look at both, how to reduce climate, uh, climate change effects from ICTs and how ICTs could help reduce climate change effects in other sectors. And it's, it's also this big question, which some people call 2% versus 98% question, or before it was 1% versus 99% question, which is because ICTs currently contribute 2% to the climate, to the uh, greenhouse gases. At the same time, they can have an impact of at least 15% reduction in other sectors, or in 98% sectors. So sometimes it's, of course, the balancing act, you know, and we can say, okay, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from ICTs might increase, and the various predictions, but uh, maybe up to 3.5%. Is it bad? But if that every increase means that we decrease by much more in other sectors, maybe that's worthwhile taking, you know, so it's always about a balance and, and having a big picture. And our work takes both of those sides into account. Also, our study group 17 has standardized, which is mainly deals with security, common alerting protocol that is XML-based data format and protocol allowing exchange of, of messages and uh, alert public, and that was also important to the, in the disaster environment. We have so-called focus groups that are most, uh, which are uh, established under the such groups, which are most more flexible uh, instruments to have a discussion on new topics and to find and identify what are the new things that need to be discussed and sometimes standardized or reflected to. So we have study group of disaster relief, network resilience and recovery, and also smart sustainable cities that looks also on various issues 
that they, especially in ICT deployment or, or in, in those areas. Another area which, is, which is, shows how everything is now interrelated and synergetic is our work on a summary cable, saving cable related work on um, for ocean monitoring disaster warnings. So as you know, submarine cables is something that is basically now, you know, and every, uh, uh, and on the bottom of every ocean, you have a lot of cables lying now, and they carry more than 97% more than of the entire international internet traffic, 95% uh, of the world's combined data voice traffic, they're everywhere. You know. So, and, you know, the, the internet, those cables also have, they're not just kind of passive cables lying down there, you know, they have repeaters, they are powered, they have, so they, are, they can be used for something else as well. So the, the work that we're doing together with a UNESCO International o Oceanographic Commission and World Meteorological Organization, so we established a joint task force, which now has more than 80 international experts from various fields. And basically this commission looks how those cables could be equipped with, with sensors and could be used to actually do the work um, in the climate monitoring and uh, disaster reduction. So, so Thank you very much. So, so looking and how how that could uh, could add more value to our work on the climate change and disaster risk reduction. So we have here very quickly five specific expert groups on various topics. We have so far issued three reports on strategy and roadmap for those type of for that type of work on engineering feasibility for this type of cables and the legal framework for deploying them. So very quickly, there are some up of our upcoming events. So we have. Next, uh, so this year, this December in Lima, quite a few uh, activities in Peru. So on ICTs and climate change, on smart sustainable cities, and our study group five meeting. And also uh, next year in Montevideo, we have a UNESCO ITU and UNESCO event on smart sustainable cities. Tomorrow also, if you want to hear specifically more about the work on the climate change side, there will be much more, not so much of a disaster, but more about climate change side. Tomorrow morning, at the same time, uh, will be the meeting of dynamic coalition of internet and climate change and there will be more even those standards which I very briefly mentioned will be discuss, discussed in much more details and uh, also you know you, you can ask even further questions on that so way forward so we need to you know so this work as we said is said it requires inclusiveness you know, and and as our moderator very nicely started you know it not, not, none of the one stakeholder can actually deal with that and respond to those challenges we need government, we need private sector, we need civil society, we need everyone on the ground and, you know, everyone's responsibility is to help themselves, yeah, so some people, so what we can, what some people can do is just to help people to help themselves, but in the end of the day, it's everyone's responsibility, so we need to work together in that regard. We need participation political commitment, we need to strengthen international cooperation, and uh, especially in terms of sharing experiences, as we hear today, just from this already workshop, you know, who participates, and you know, we already see that the value of seeing various examples. And we, we need awareness and discussion on, on these best practices, and on both in disaster relief and climate change. So thank you very much. These are some, some of the links uh, on to, to discover more information, what ITU is doing that you got, and feel free to talk, talk to me after that. I can share my contacts and connect to my colleagues that work more detailed, and if you are interested in a very specific area on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, before going to the Q&A with you, is there anything from the remote participation? Not much. Um, maybe it's too early for Europe. <laughs> too late for the US or Americas. But um, um, I would like to ask you, if you have something to share in addition to your questions or comments, please be prepared. So after finishing this short question and answer session with Thomas, we'll open up the floor. It's not only the question and answer, but just sharing our best practices or knowledges or other activities. Um, but first thing first, uh, any question to Thomas? Yes. Thomas, you speak very quickly, and I have very old ears, uh, so I listen slowly. But you said 888. Uh, which is a magic number. Tell me more about what that is, please. So thank you very much. Yes, so um, it's n you're not the first person to know that uh, deficiency of mine. So I'll, and um, uh, so I'll try now to uh, just to explain it on this specific topic. So 888 is an, you know so 888 allows the OCHA 
So when they coordinate... Uh, what is OCHA? OCHA is Office of Coordinating of Humanitarian Assistance. So, Which is so a UN agency tasked for the disaster management thing, indeed. right? So it's, uh, it's an agency that coordinates other UN agencies. Sorry, there's a UN agency that coordinates other UN agencies on the field when they respond to disasters or when they respond to emergencies, where, where, whenever humanitarian assistance is needed. So every UN agency, including ITU, including World Food Program, including other, you know, UNICEF, when they work on the ground in, in many of where the multi multi-stakeholder assistance is needed on the ground, they would be held by Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance to make sure that they all work together, they don't step on the air with other stoves when it's needed, and they actually can do the work in the most efficient and effective manner. So number 888 means that, you know, for example, when you call, I don't know, Switzerland, you dial a plus four one, yeah, and then you dial a national number, you know, when you, I haven't checked, it's my fault I haven't checked the number for Indonesia, but, uh, but it's, so every country has a national so Indonesia number is plus 62. So 888 means that when OCHA establishes their network on the ground when a disaster happens, so their numbers would be plus 888, and uh, then the number they assign to the specific uh, device that they could coordinate and establish network on the ground. So that allows them to establish network on the ground quickly without reliance on national coordination system and on national networks. So that allows them to come with the equipment, set up the network, start communicating. If the no, it, that, this 888 number is the number of the public network. So it's the international public network number, so that allows access also from the public networks. Right, but it, it so if there was a disaster here, uh, you would not plug into the local phone company. You would have your own network here that somebody could just call plus 888 and get you. No, so this is a complementary, you know, so complementary element of that. So if the local networks, uh, if you are able to use local networks, you know, you are able to use network and local networks, again, so use that. And there's a lot of work done on ensuring resiliency of the local networks to be able to respond in disasters and to prioritize also calls when the disaster strikes. This, this facility is a separate or a complementary facility given to uh, this UN agency so that if they cannot rely on the local networks, they can bring in the equipment and quickly to respond. Once the local networks are again available, they can use local networks. So this is, let's say, the way to say if something is, you know, if we have a scorcher situation where then local networks are not there, you cannot respond, this allows them to bring the equipment, start communicating quickly, and then start rebuilding the, uh, start rebuilding on the ground. Is that related to this? So, is, is they then establish a dynamic numbering plan underneath that plus eight eight country code? So I, you know, so I'll, I'll decide I'm number mm -hmm. one, two, three, four, five, and John here is number two, four, five, six, and you know, water is, mm -hmm. So it's a dynamically established numbering code, numbering plan underneath. So, so I'll just also explain the difference of the roles. What ITU does, so that also I, I don't over, overset your expectations about my own expertise. What ITU does, we had give this number and give this a facility to Office of Coordinating of Human Insurance Assistance. Right. How they then do the specific numbering with agencies, that's their responsibility yes, and that's yes. their ability. So, and that's not yet... A, 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 when, when was this established? That's, sorry, it's Narelle Clark here from the Internet Society. I should have said that yes. first for the record. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm very curious as to when, when was this numbering... Uh, when, when was this number issued? Okay, well, I, would have to, I would have to check that and I would so have to refer so back. So then my next question is, how broadly have the surrounding networks or the rest of the world's networks been conditioned to accept this, accept mm -hmm. this relatively new number? So what I, you know, now, but I, I'm happy to follow up on this it's question. Okay. I'll, I'll look it up then. Yeah. So um, then, if I might. But also it just, to just again, to understand <laughs> yeah, how, yeah. The, how the numbering works generally yeah. and this yeah. type of coordination activity. So once ITU assigns that number, so that means this number is internationally now accepted number. That yes. means that no, 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 operators no. need to route calls to that number. Yeah. But how is then established in physical terms? That is then for the implementing agency. Yes, yeah, so I, I'm a telecoms engineer. Oh, so yeah, yeah. So you, you <laughs> I, I better than I. Yeah, I'm a lawyer. So. <laughs> so if I might just squeeze one more quick one. 
Um, at the wicket last mm -hmm. year, it was agreed that we would adopt an international emergency code. Uh, so, and I was just wondering how the, the rest of the panel felt about the concept of using, you know, a harmonised system, you know, one telephone mm -hmm. number or, or one um, packet-based mm -hmm. number or, or some such for, for uh, distributing um, information or, or signalling that I have an emergency. Just before, I just got a very clarification what, that, what is agreed and, and that and the wicket. Or, uh, because because this, uh, the difference between that and this is that the numbers that we agreed there are harmonized international numbers. So this is the same number that you can dial in every country, but who will pick up that number is very different. Is that the local agency that will pick up that number? So, yeah. So um, this number, this number is just very quickly. This number is something that's specifically assigned to the one agency. So this is a bit of a difference. But and just for clarification, WICIT is WCIT World Conference on International Telecommunications, hosted by the ITU last year in Dubai. Debated a lot about new internet, uh, international telecom regulations, whether including the internet or not was an interesting topic. But that's that's <laughs> off the topic in the room. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zhu Xiang from Institute of Remote Sensing and the Digital Earth, a Chinese Academy of Science. So I have a question about uh, maybe mainly information security. As uh, Thomas mentioned, you have a different study group uh, under the ITU, mm -hmm. so about the different critical issues. So uh, my question is, uh, on the internet, you have a different uh, information from different sources, uh, the many, many information provider. So do you have a dedicated study, uh, especially on the information validation or uh, authentication of uh, information provider? Because you know you have many, many people, they would like to public, publish their uh, pre a forecasting result about earthquake or something else or something information you could not to uh, disturb the accuracy. So do you have a dedicated study, especially something a study group on this field? So uh, in terms of the specific documents now that would be adopted, I'm not aware of that at this moment, but I can follow up. But in terms of the process, definitely our study group 17 on of the standardization sector is a proper place to discuss that. And as ITU is membership driven organization and sector members and academia are full members, so we'd really invite uh, your organization to, if you, especially if you are, I would have to check if you are ITU member, but if not also kind of find a way, we could find a way to, to bring those that topic into our discussion and then with our other membership to actually you know, move, move forward that process to have agreed. So I would, you know, we would really welcome those topics that are very actual and important to be brought into the discussion and agreed internationally. Okay, thank you, Thomas, and thank you all for who gave the questions to your presentations. Now I'd like to shift the focus to the entire presentation or subject of a workshop. Uh, how do we use the, or maximize the power of the Internet or largely the ICT to deal with these natural powers? i.e. the disaster or climate change or both combined. Um, any, any take, any burning comment, question? Yes, sir. And we don't have too much time, so be mindful of how much you say. Uh, hi, Brecken from New Zealand. Um, so one of the things that's been happening in New Zealand is we did have some earthquakes um, and now all our local emergency response groups are focusing on what to do in future cases. Um, but one of the things that we've been discussing a lot, I've been kind of talking to them in some of my other roles, um, has been the idea of disaster response being more than the day after or the week after, but also how fast you bring communities back up to um, standard and happy and doing what they were doing beforehand. Um, and I think that's probably one of the areas where the internet can be even more useful in that we do have that issue that it goes down and gets all fogged up on the day after and there's all this other stuff that happens. But actually, like, the, really, the internet we can get back pretty fast um, and then really looking at what we can do in the space of getting people communicating together, helping each other, really pushing those resources around in the local community um, as being in some ways more key than the immediate 
uh, making sure there's water and food on the day of. Um, so we've got a set of things in Wellington that are happening about sort of building that community experience beforehand, getting people meeting their neighbours, getting all that, that data there so that they're empowered to connect with each other. Um, I've got some involvement in some geo-based alerting and reporting stuff to say the stuff is there, that stuff's there, that kind of thing. Uh, but I'd be interested in anyone doing similar. I think that is one of the topics that is like discussed globally because in Japan we have the earthquake and we respond and we started something called Half for Japan, which would be you know, a team of people who would be responding to the next one, and we have the forces now. But for example, in New York, when Sandy hit, Open New York City group was, you know, organizing hackathon right after. And right now, like uh, two weeks ago, there was a uh, hackathon called uh, Hack for Good hackathon. So it was in 20 cities all around Kathmandu, New York, San Francisco, all around the world. And they were trying to, you know, get the community so that when something happens, we can respond and Although there's nothing happening right now in terms of disaster, people are getting together so that they can get ready to, you know, use their technolo technological skills to respond to these incidents. So I think that's one topic that is discussed around the world and a lot of people are studying. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gonola Estbrink, uh, Australian IGF ambassador. And my apologies, I um, was not able to participate in the whole meeting, so this might have already been covered. Um, you've probably heard in the news there's a lot of bushfires in Australia at the moment. Um, it's a very worrying situation for many people. Um, we, in, in Australia, we have, the Australian government has developed um, a common alerting protocol, a CAP, which is a standardised system um, allowing a consistent um, um, way of transmitting emergency messages. And, and it's an XML-based system. Um, it, can, it means that broadcasting can be done over different media, uh, radio, TV, and it can be presented in a way that uh, um, means that, for example, deaf people, if there's... Uh, um, sign language involved, there can be preset messages to assist with that. So it's, it's quite a useful system for the whole community. Um, and as I said, it's in, an international standard. It's been adopted in, in Australia, Canada, Sri Lanka has uh, done some trials. And uh, I'm interested if there's other countries who are looking at uh, the common alerting protocol. So, uh, so this is one of the protocols that we, so it was mentioned also in, just kind of for the benefit of other people in, uh, on the slides, that's based on ITUT recommendation X1303. So, but in terms of the specific implementations, uh, I don't have that information at the moment, so I'll have to come back to you on that, but we can connect to it. My name is Juan Camilo from Medellin, Colombia. I work with early warning systems out there. I want to share a case where the importance of the data integration for timely alerting the community is very important. You can have seismic risks, you can have rain, flash floods, landslides, and you need to have all that information together. How can you make it on some models, some numerical forecasting to help people. Anybody on the panel or in the room? No. So you, you're can looking for some kind of... Mo yes. Can we clarify the question? So are you trying to get the data of the people or get the data of like, I don't know, data from many variables, not, not really one, like in your case was seismic, in his case was like meteorological, but data integration as part of. <laughs> How to organize the information at large? 
Um, if I may, uh, there are, I think, two ways or two schools of thought for this. One is to have some common framework or standardized ways before it happens, such as CAP or other areas IT has been working. Uh, to put it into the, some other extreme, perhaps, is ad hoc or flexible thing that Google and others coordinate and organize on the fly. Um, I think these are two complementary ways, not contradicting, but I, I invite your comments on these. So one thing we do at Google's crisis response page is we have like a map that can overlay with gasoline stations or weather information or uh, what else? shelter information, where are the shelters, because they, they brought up an ad hoc and um, the hospital information. So there's overlaying like various uh, data um, in one shot. And if you go to that crisis space, um, then you can, you know, select which uh, data you want. So, so we're already doing it when th things happen, we you know, collect data and then map it. So I think we actually have the uh, infrastructure for that. By we, do you mean Google or Sorry, yeah, community? Google, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Google does have that infrastructure for that. And for example, uh, when Izuoshima, you know, the recent typhoon happened, we scrambled to get the website up and we had the data up. Um, we, we did a lot for um, the Sandy as well. So when something happens, we collect data and make it visualize so that people can find the data that they want. Yeah, there was OpenStreetMap people who often prepares the platform of map and most people, or they invite any information related to the disaster to be shared exactly. uh, using so GIS technology. OpenStreetMap as well as Ushahidi. Yes. And Ushahidi in Japan is called Saigai in, uh, Shinsai Info. And these people are, you know, crowdsourcing all the information so that it's going to be uh, visible. So there's several projects going on. But after the round of emergency, you sometimes discuss what worked and what didn't, and then you try to set up a, another framework for the next round. Right. And internationally, there have been several efforts, mm -hmm. I believe, that you may be involved with. How many people, I'd like to ask you, were really concerned about the disasters to come to your local community or your house or your, please raise your hands. Others are just um, <laughs> who knows happily. who knows where to evacuate if this venue is hit by a tsunami now. You know. <laughs> On this building, go upstairs, I okay. think. But where, where I'm staying, um, I checked it out. It's scary. That's the two-story building is not quite enough. But there's some. Um, evacuation or emergency staircases I found and we, we can go to the t top of the roof. Whether it's enough or not, we don't really know. Those who went to the third floor of some cities in Rikuzen Takata, for example, in Japan, didn't survive. Yeah, third if you floor had a fourth was floor flooded. and up, yep. mm -hmm. they did. But that's for the particular tsunami. Yes. There's no guarantee for the next one. Anyway, um, just I wanted to see the sense of I will give priority to those who haven't spoken up, but so please. Um, I'm Rohan Samarajiva from LearnAsia and also the Lanka Software Foundation. Uh, at LearnAsia, we did some of the uh, CAP, uh, earliest CAP trials, particularly multilingual uh, trials uh, after the 2004 tsunami. Um, and uh, from the La Lanka Software Foundation, there's a comment uh, to the previous question which is uh, we have uh, spun off Sahana uh, as the main uh, disaster management software that has even been used in uh, Manhattan. And uh, that's a, not an ad hoc approach. The idea is that the disaster management managers in the various areas would populate it with the relevant information beforehand, ideally. But in many cases, that doesn't happen. Uh, what I would like to raise here is this general idea uh, that the internet is resilient, the internet is robust compared to everything else. Uh, that may be true in the developed countries, but it's not necessarily true in some of the developing countries. Particularly, you take a country like Myanmar or Bangladesh, uh, where until recently there was only one international cable linking uh, Bangladesh to the world, an undersea cable, a very long one, see maybe four. And uh, Myanmar is linked by CMAV3. 
something happens to that, you can say goodbye to internet connectivity. Because in the end, those bits have got to travel through something. So uh, with SCAP, uh, we are looking at uh, doing a mapping, and I believe ITU is also involved in this, uh, mapping of the uh, uh, existing fiber optic cable connectivity in the, in the region, uh, looking at the gaps, looking at the vulnerable points, looking at what can be done uh, with some relevance to disaster issues, uh, but also looking at it in terms of essentially moving the underlying uh, physical network to more of a mesh configuration that will involve both undersea and terrestrial components, which uh, we in Asia do not seem to have. We seem to rely excessively on, uh, on undersea cables. So I thought that would be relevant to uh, sort of an underlying element to the whole question of optimizing the use of the Internet. Thank you. Just to take advantage of being a moderator who holds the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, from what I heard, in the September 21st earthquake that hit Taiwan in 1999, the undersea cable was cut off. A few hours, eight or seven, nine hours after the quake, not immediately because it's the afterquake, which rolled some stones and which cut off all the traffic of at least Malaysia and Singapore for about a few hours or even to a day. That's 10 or 13 years ago. But in the case of the East uh, uh, Japan Great Earthquake, very few lines survived, actually, for between Japan and the rest of the world, and also inside Japan. They were lucky to have just one or two lines, and they were scared. And a few days after, with the, all this um, problem of the nuclear power plant thing, the fuel was another problem. Many ISPs and data centers were just trying to get additional fuel to run their generators because there's not enough electricity. So um, if the demand goes up, you need to prepare the supply. And the demand curve is getting high for ICT. And uh, how about to prepare the redundancy of the supplies is another question. But um, OK, I, I'm sorry. I, I need to give the floor to you again. Uh, you mentioned before about evacuation and going to a third floor. Well, if electricity is cut and you're a wheelchair user, I'm not exactly sure how you're going to get up there. Um, and this is a problem when it comes to um, uh, disaster risk planning, um, that often people with disabilities have not been included in those planning processes. And in this region, for the first time, disability was included in the fifth Asian Ministerial Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction, that was last year. So there needs to be increased data in regard to um, how systems should operate and where people with disabilities are located and how the systems would work in regard to people with disabilities. And any end-to-end -end early warning systems should really include uh, people with disabilities in that planning and also including disability organisations in the actual planning processes I think would be would be very important as well. Any comment from the panel on this matter? I saw you and him so please wait. You have something? Uh, just Thomas? very quick. Indeed, yes. it's uh, just kind of agreeing that it's very topical, uh, very, very important topic. And uh, I think for ITU, it's, uh, we, we're kind of well placed to kind of look at both sides because we have a lot of, and we'll have a separate two, at least two events of accessibility of ICTs in IGF and to discuss how, uh, how people should be, how ICTs could be used for people with disabilities and also how accessibilities, or how ICTs could. Uh, how people with disabilities can access ICTs better. And in that regard, we also recently had an event on October 11 specifically uh, in ITU, specifically on looking on disaster, ma disaster management and preparedness for people with disabilities. So just kind of bringing that, that it is a topic that is really important. We concur on that, and we welcome further discussions, and we can you know, talk on that further afterwards. Um, just a quick comment. So um, when the... Um, disaster happened in Japan. There was two discussions. So one is can technology help these, you know, dis disability uh, people with disability evacuate? And the other one was can we get the community back? Because a lot of places have community separated, and 
when you actually have it, like, getting somebody who would help you, like old people or, you know, disability people, evacuate is more very important. And in some of the really, like, uh, places that really need cars to operate, like, go wherever, these places were really, like, near the ocean, but they evacuated everybody, and no nobody was died, although it was hit by the tsunami, because the community was really, really, like, c you know, connected. Whereas, like, in other places, people just didn't care, and, you know, some people were. So, so that's one thing. And the other thing is um, about after the disaster happens. So people go into, into shelters, and they're sleeping in the shelters, right? And some people can't speak, so when they're asking, like, does anybody want, like, food or lunch or whatever, they didn't hear. So they couldn't, like, vo voice up. And also some people had specific, um, like, diseases or not diseases but traits that um, – but they can't be vocal, so they didn't know. So what happened in Japan was a volunteer group went to do, like, an assessment of each person about – you know, can you speak or like assessment of what is a trait that we should be care careful about? So, so that used to be the community function, but because everybody evacuated to somewhere that you don't know where everybody else is, like who who they are. So that was another thing that happened. Sorry, <laughs> I'm talking too much. All right, thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, let me introduce. My name is Tiki Gumbana. I'm uh, ISAC ambassador for IGF from Indonesia. So um, I might have one comment or might be one question. So regarding the question was raised from this gentleman just now about how to, how to respond to the emergency uh, in the very first time. Yeah. I came from Aceh, actually. I, I, I was born and raised in Aceh. Even though I was not there during the tsunami 2004, but I managed to get home on the third day after the tsunami. So what happened was, uh, and I share some experience, Yes, on the first, second, and the third day, maybe, uh, technology was not there, right? So, why? Because we never expect this kind of uh, disaster to happen, right? We, we've, we've been living there for, uh, when we had earthquake, but not as bad as this. I, I was in Malaysia at that time, and uh, what I heard, because the connection, because we don't have any communication at that time, what I heard it was just a, a big flood. Right, it's not tsunami. It was a big flood. But when I got there and on the third day, I found out that is the half of the city in Banda Aceh was already like uh, turned down, destroyed. Many facilities destroyed. So technology at that time was r really not there. So uh, what happened was everything was conducted manually. So uh, even for me, I have uh, to find a family. I have to go one by one, finding camp to camp like that, all manual. Right, so um, it takes some time for technology to, to be set up, to be back up, right? Uh, at least one week, four days to one week. So, uh, yeah, so I was wondering, uh, is there any, during this, during this time, during this, uh, the first, second, and third days when the, the uh, what do you call, the immediate response needed, do we have any protocol, standard protocol for the relief workers, for example? how to coordinate or how to communicate uh, using very minimum technology, you know. Uh, if the internet is there, then it's easier for us to communicate with the rest of the world. But when the technology is not there yet, maybe, I don't know, if we have some. Thank you. So, of course, you know, admitting that my overall expertise is not in this overall disaster relief, but on that uh, very specific fact, I think from our perspective, what we try to do, so in a few, few elements, first of all, to make sure that technology can reach people as fast as possible, can stamp a convention that allows equipment to be brought from overseas much quicker and be coordinated with local, uh, local authorities much quicker. Hence, for example, this uh, ability for, you know, for specific codes for Office of Coordinating of Humanitarian Assistance, so that allows them to start at least for relief workers operating much quicker. Hence, uh, so that's kind of one part of that, so making sure the technology reaches people much quicker. The other thing is there are different technologies and um, in the, that way, for example, in our radio communication sector, we make sure that when we radio spectrum is coordinated, you know, so it's one thing 
mobile networks, and it's ubiquitous, but sometimes we can rely just on the mobile networks. So again, from ITU perspective, we coordinate spectrum, and, and spectrum is allocated for specific emergency needs and for for the law for response um, uh, response agencies that they could use special their own radio devices and their own technologies that, that are more resilient and better protected. And then the third level, of course, which is basically on the country level, uh, country level, uh, but we assist the countries in, in thinking of that preparedness, is specifically to have the networks more resilient and to be more prepared for that, uh, for the events that happen. So now, so, I, so from my personal experience, because it was a regulator and policy advisor, at least in two countries, very, very uh, you know, prone to disasters, one in the Caribbean, the other in the Pacific, you know. So the national coordinating effort, the national preparedness effort, is made, you know, plays a big role from the level, so like, for example, about fuel, you know. So whether there isn't a fuel, whether the operators think about that, and you would see when disaster strike, some operators can wake up much quicker than other operators. And then whether coordination among the local operators is you know, what level, you know, whether they need to kind of rebuild the network separately or can coordinate on that. And these type of elements play a very important role. This is a national level, but ITU is also happy to kind of help and advise on those topics on a national level if needed. Thanks. Thank you, Thomas. We have two more minutes. Um, so maybe one final question. Thank you. Uh, Michael Kelly uh, from the American Bar Association Task Force on Internet Governance and also Professor of International Law at Creighton University. Um, I have a book coming out with Akiko Ito uh, on the international law of disaster relief. One of the questions that we keep running into is the problem of sovereignty and the sovereignty barrier uh, for victim states. Myanmar and uh, Cyclone Nagaris was the example we, were, we ran into where the junta refused to accept aid um, and caused hundreds of needless deaths. Uh, if, the, if the government's forces are deployed to block the ports and airports from receiving international aid, um, can increased Internet activity between civil society elements within the victim state and international disaster relief groups be an answer to this sovereignty problem if they identify alternate routes of international aid delivery and go around the government that's resisting aid? Does this solve that problem? Potentially. It may take five minutes to answer, <laughs> Thomas. Or uh, me, it's or? Just, I think I'm not, not so sure if it's I'm best place, but I think everyone, uh, so colleagues, said maybe your question. Now, we're working with the member states, you know, so, we're, so governments are our counterparts. So we, of course, assume that the governments want to help their people, and then our, you know, if our role is to, if they don't, our work, uh, role is to work with them to, you know, to help them understand that they need to help their people. But, but of course, uh, what was said in the very beginning, this is multi-stakeholder effort. So we, we think it's always good if there are, you know, other, you know whatever, whatever works, you know, so, and whatever works uh, to help people is good. I think I need to wrap up, if I may. But before doing so, if you have anything, Amber, being a local host in Indonesia, and you refrained quite a few times. Microphone? No? No. Okay, you're so humble. Um, Fumi, you spoke a bit much, so you don't have oh much, too much. But um, uh, it's always the case that when we deal with the disaster-related sessions and climate change sessions, people who have real direct experience often tend to want to share a lot because they have such an devastating experiences and uh, lessons to share. I think I'm sure many of you have the same experience or feel, um, myself included. Um, to me, this is sort of three, third or fourth time organizing this workshop around the disaster, one at APRIGF in Singapore, that's in 2011, another one in 2011 in, uh, I don't remember where it was, Vilnius or the, at the IGF. Um, this is the most well-attended workshop somehow, so I really thank you. Maybe partially because being Indonesia, Indonesia is well known for many disasters. But also I feel very um, strongly that Indonesian people have been working very hard to deal with it, especially using the ICTs, both in a prepared manner as well as ad hoc. To answer to the last question, uh, what I heard from my friend again from APT was right after the Aceh thing, uh, tsunami, he went there with Australian uh, flight. 
he was specially asked to go there, uh, being the APG, the ISP member with some technicians with Wi-Fi. But they coordinated different telecom mobile operators to come up with single number, four digit, to be used for anyone to share any information as a bulletin board, whereabouts of your family or, you know, question or, you know, all this person finder using mobile with text message only, and which didn't happen in Japan because the mobile operators couldn't really coordinate as fast as they should be. So after a while, they started to discuss, and maybe it's in place now. So, but um, in any case, um, that's a national level. But to go beyond, the, one of the motivations, particularly myself, have been you know, trying to organize this is the lack of international coordination, at least to reach a level of sufficient to the next really catastrophic disaster. We had a lot of help. The support came from outside Japan. The Japanese side were not really ready to work together, including translating Sahana, for example. Um, but so I found right after this large-scale disaster, we are really prompted to, um, motivated to do some work together. One year, two years, three years, five years. Then it's, it's going to reduce. Of course, there's another disaster comes up, and then you're motivated again. But um, I'd like to see a little more sort of concrete efforts uh, to talk to each other, but also set up some kind of framework beyond the intergovernmental body, because not because only this is the IGF, but some kind of large-scale disasters are so bad that no government of a nation can really deal with the people. That happened in Japan, that happened in Aceh, that may happen to your place next. So that you need real you know, um, people power to help the government as well as help the, the victims. Um, I think I'm talking too much. If anything else, burning to come up. Otherwise, with my great thanks to the speakers and the floors, I'd like to close this session. Thank you very much.